Thank you very much for coming. Um, welcome to the sixth event in the Biennale Archive Stories, um, a series that was conceived by the Artistic Director of the 21st Biennale of Sydney, Mami Kateoka. And we want to start tonight by thanking the Director of the MCA, Lizanne McGregor, for offering to host um, this very special evening that celebrates the relationships between the Biennale of Sydney and its long-standing exhibition partners. It's hard to imagine that it was 42 years ago, in 1976, that the second Biennale of Sydney took place entirely at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And we've enjoyed working together ever since, every two years, ever since then. 32 years ago, in 1986, uh, Artspace became an exhibition partner of the Biennale for the first time. 20 years ago, in 1998, the MCA hosted the Biennale for the first time and in 2000 dedicated all the floors of the, of the uh, museum to the Biennale. And just six years ago, in 2012, Carriage Works became our exhibition partner for the first time with their unique heritage building providing a very special context for and all sorts of new possibilities for the artists. Before handing over to Mami to introduce tonight's talk, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, my colleagues and dear friends, Michael, Alexi, Lizanne and Lisa, for the wonderful, the truly wonderful collaboration that we have and for making so many memorable biennales possible. I'd also like to acknowledge the Sydney Harbour Foreshore Trust, who though not present tonight among our speakers, has provided the very exciting stage of Cockatoo Island for Biennale since 2008, and as well, uh, the 4A Centre of Contemporary Asian Art, who in 2018 are um, going to be partnering with us for the second time in the, in the, in the Biennale's history. We uh, have stopped counting the days because it's getting too scary. But we are probably, uh, I think we're less than a week out for our, from our very first uh, tour um, with, uh, with some of the people who've made the exhibition possible and the great tradition of the barbecue for everybody who's installing with all the artists. We, we are officially opening Today's the 28th, I think. We're officially opening in just over two weeks. And I think it's a very special opportunity to thank Mami Katooka, Artistic Director of the 21st Biennale of Sydney, for an absolutely extraordinary two-year journey, which is going to result in another very, very memorable Biennale of Sydney. And on a personal level, I want to thank you, Mami, for your dedication, not only to produce this particular <laughs> edition, but she has reached back into the Biennale's history and is teaching us things that m most of us, many of us, if sometimes even all of us, have perhaps forgotten about what it was when the Biennale was founded uh, 45 years ago this year. And uh, this desire to bring global art uh, from, uh, from countries all around the world, more than 1,800 artists to Sydney for your pleasure, enjoyment, edification and contemplation. Thank you, thank you, Mami, and thank you to our wonderful partners for making this possible. Thank you, Joanne, for introduction. And uh, thank you for coming again. And I'm pleased to have this sixth 
uh, edition of uh, Biennale Archive Stories, which I started in December 2016. So it's uh, already 15 months ago. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to work with the uh, archive itself to try to understand where we are now uh, in the time that there are so many Biennales in throughout the world. And I just had to question myself what I'm going to do with the Biennale of Sydney. Is it still important? And if so, how is it, is it important? But also I was interested in that this model, there's so many different models in the different Biennales, but this particular model is the model that uh, Biennale doesn't have any venue, but uh, the, as function as the office, and uh, Biennale works with existing venues as a partners, and uh, where they do have uh, contemporary art programs in every day, every year round. So uh, I thought it's interesting to um, ask today, this version is uh, bringing these uh, four heads of uh, the partner institutions, which is really rare, probably, that if there is a bomb tonight, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Sydney Art Institution will be the best <laughs> jobs available. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I thought it's very interesting to hear the We're personal uh, experience uh, of the Biennale and see how, as an institution, represent, representing institutions, how we could uh, work possibly much closer than now, and uh, as a sort of future proposal that I'm, I'm finishing my one, but uh, my version, but uh, something that I could, I could pro possibly leave for the next or future iteration. But I wanted to start in order, as uh, Joanne introduced, when these institutions started to work as a partner for the Biennale. So, uh, the Michael, I would like to ask, when did you see Biennale for the first time? Thank you, Mami. Thank you for the welcome. And also thank you for, for coming to Sydney and working on this Biennale. You're doing a terrific job and we just feel very honoured you've put so much time and thought and creativity into the, into the Biennale. Can't wait to see it open. Okay, for your question, and thank you all for coming too. Um, I think I might have been a bit of a late adapter with the Biennale. I think my, the, my first real concrete memory is a 1992 Biennale. And it would be particularly at Pier, Pier 2-3, mm. um, an installation by a collective, I'm not quite sure what happened to them after, it was called BP. I think they were a French collective. Uh, and they have those sort of barrels of oil and, and weapons in the oil. And for someone who was um, born in Canberra, sort of citizen of the, the tidy town, and uh, working at the National Gallery of Australia, <laughs> to actually see art, see contemporary art in a, in a sort of a, a sort of post-industrial sort of space mm. uh, was a terrific thing. Mm. Um, also, at that time I was working mainly in historical art. I was curator of Asian art at the National Gallery, working in historical Asian art. Mm. So I think that's another way that biennales can sort of bring different types of audiences, people with different sort of interests, sort of sort of very concretely mm. into that contemporary art space. Was it important for you to have biennale as an opportunity to encounter these uh, contemporary art? Yeah, definitely, because I think if, if that hadn't have been the case, so 1992, the MCA doesn't exist. Um, art Gallery of New South Wales has always shown contemporary art, but it was, um, well, if it hadn't been nudged along by the Biennale a bit, as we'll probably talk about a bit later on. Mm. I think, you know, in Canberra, uh, the National Gallery was certainly showing some contemporary art, but, it, but within a very traditional, mm. sort of highly architectural, air-conditioned and, and sort of and secure setting. I think that I think without the Biennale, one wouldn't have had that idea that, that art, really contemporary art, can break out of museums more and go to different spaces around the city, help you look at the city in different ways as well. Mm. And uh, the following question goes to uh, Alexi. And uh, I think um, uh, art space started eighty three. Yes. But uh, moved to current space in ninety two. Yes. So we have an interesting history with the Biennale, which is that we were a kind of associated venue in the 80s with two exhibitions that were quite political. And they were called uh, Displacements, Palestinian Political Imagery and the Displacement of Aboriginal Australians um, in 1984. And in 1986, we did a show called Margins and Institutions, Art in Chile. But it wasn't until 1992 that we came on board as a permanent partner venue mm. for the Biennale. 
But when was your but what first was my one? first experience? <laughs> All right, well, I have to say with the caveat that I don't uh, condone juvenile delinquency or truancy, but it was 1990 and I was still at high school. And I have a theory that kids who weren't popular at art school generally go into the art world. And I used to be dropped off at the train station by my mother and I had to cross a railway bridge to get on the bus. And some days I'd take a detour down the stairs and get on the train. And I'd grab a friend and we'd go into the city and because I was a nerd, I wouldn't <laughs> true it somewhere cool, I would go to the Art Gallery of New South Wales. <laughs> oh, <what cool. laughs> the nerdiest delinquent <laughs> on history. <laughs> and um, so this 1990, this, this particular time, I went and actually encountered my first Biennale of Sydney, which was Rene Bloch's um, Ready Made Boomerang, which mm -hmm. was extraordinary for me. And, um, you know, I saw, I still remember seeing Nam June Pike's TV Buddha and um, what's great is, you know, I don't, I don't know for any, there's so many people in this room who love art. And I think what's so great about the Biennale for me is that you, in a sense, become a kind of emotional custodian of works. They live in you. And there are works that you see throughout your lifetime at different points that you recognise as if they were your own. You know, there's some sort of sense of kind of being connected to them. And seeing Nam June Pike's TV Buddha was this work that stayed with me. And I remember seeing it in John Caldor's collection in his home. I remember seeing it in a Biennale in Berlin. I've seen it in museums internationally. And every time I see it, I think, oh, I know you. And, um, and it was really from that experience in 1990. Yeah. And I saved up for the catalogue, Art is Easy. And it wasn't true. But <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years later, I went to art school. And uh, it really was because of that Biennale in so many ways and because of the existence of the Sydney Biennale that I thought that being something like a curator of contemporary art could be a legitimate pathway for someone like me. Fantastic. Yeah, mm. actually, we're bringing back Rune Block to mm. Sydney. He's coming on 11th of March, and he's giving a talk on 16th. Uh, and uh, he has made a tremendous contribution. Yeah. And so we want to go back to his story. I actually, I just will say, I, I met him in 1999 uh -huh. when I was working for a gallery called Gita Weisser Gallery. And she'd work with René as his exhibition producer for Ready Made Boomerang. Mm. And René was the first international curator I'd ever met. And to meet him nine years after truanting school made my yeah. head spin. <laughs> and he sang the song, Perhaps, Perhaps, Perhaps. <laughs> and I thought he was the coolest curator I'd ever known. <laughs> I think he's fantastic. You, you, yeah, you meet, meet him now, it's, it's still really fantastic. OK, so <clears throat> going to uh, Lisa Maclega and uh, Yes, coming from Scotland, when did you see Biennale for the first time? Well, I had actually visited Australia quite a bit before I moved here mm. in 1999, so I was very fortunate to be here in 98. I can't quite remember why, but I saw Jonathan Watkins' Biennale. Um, and Every it was day. Th spread through the city, and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it enormously. But I was very perplexed because there was this, you know, a lot of really interesting work, but there was this incredible... Uh, amount of critical n you know, negative backlash and it seemed to me that against both the Museum of Contemporary Art at the time and the Biennale so it was kind of and I was living in the UK where similar things happened you know you'd put on something you know an installation and you'd have the tabloids attacking you so mm. it was kind of like it was very familiar to me that mm. kind of attack and um, but my memory of an artwork was it was taking the ferry out to Goat Island because of course the pre pr the mm. predecessor of Cockatoo was yes. a, was Goat Island and, and Martin Creed had filled a room with balloons. It mm. was absolutely oh. wonderful. And David Cunningham had an amazing soundscape. So those mm. two very experiential works. And I think watching the audience reacting, and Martin Creed is a very, you know, um, cerebral artist in many ways, but watching the way in which an audience was reacting to these um, experiential works, I think was for me a kind of like light bulb moment. And I thought, wow, people are really you know, able to engage with this work, even they may not totally understand it, but there is something very, in, because of the interactive mm. nature of it, mm. and the whole experience of going out to the to, to the island, and, and I think that's the change that's happened, is the whole experience, whether it's a museum experience, or whether it's a, a an outdoors experience, the mm. idea of, of, of engaging with art in a way that isn't just about the viewer and the artwork, but is about the whole environment. Mm. And so for me, that was incredibly memorable. Mm. Yeah, and then, and then 10 years later, or 12 years later, um, Carriage Works joined. And I think it's massive space. And using <laughs> Carriage, Carriage Works and then also Cockatoo Island, mm. it gives so much opportunity for artists to do something which cannot be done in a museum space. So uh, bringing Carriage Works as another partner venue is tremendous uh, benefit. But uh, 
When did you see the Biennale for the first time? <laughs> the first time was Tony Bond's Biennale in 1992, which was Boundary Rider. And at that time, I was at art school um, at Wollongong, and um, I had been learning painting, you know, you know, very traditional practice of being a painter, and that was my intention always, was, was going to be an artist and to be a painter. And um, it was, um, I think, the first time that, I suppose I really experienced a large-scale contemporary art exhibition and I think it really shifted and I was thinking yesterday can I actually remember any of the work which I don't think I can but I can actually remember the experience of seeing the work mm. and I think um, it really opened my mind to I suppose contemporary practice in a different way because I was experiencing a very traditional art school model and I think not long after that I stopped um, being an artist and actually went and studied law, but I think it, it, <laughs> it made me realise that maybe what I was learning was disconnected from um, a broader contemporary experience. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think sometimes exhibitions, experiences like that can, yeah, shift things mm. in you. Um, and I think, you know, definitely growing up in the country and then being educated in regional New South Wales, I think, yeah, being able to access that was really important. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And did you continue seeing the Biennale since that time? Yeah, I've seen everyone since then. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any memorable edition or specific works? or? Um, not necessarily. I think I, my real love has been part of the Biennale and a lot of my memories are around meeting artists that I've loved and mm. experiencing their work for the first mm. time and then having the opportunity to spend time with them. Mm. I think it's not only, you know, that exhibition experience, it's the industry experience of the Biennale being here and those artists being here um, and the actual commitment that the Biennale has had to supporting new work and experiencing things that are very fresh. Mm. And I think that's had a big influence on my own practice um, but also has a, had a big influence, I think, you know, across the city and across Australia as well. Mm. Michael, have you continued seeing, or you are out of the country for some time? Yeah. Oh. I, I've been in and out of the country um, a lot, um, but I have all, always kept up with the BNLA for sure. Do you have any specific works that change your life or like specifically yeah. memorable <laughs> <laughs> setting very high standards um, for the better or the worse um, probably probably actually my most favorite experience would be from the last Biennale in 2016 which mm. I hope doesn't mean I'm I've lost my long-term memory yet um, <laughs> but it was Taro Shinoda's work mm. uh, in the, in that central double Mm. Um, double height space at the gallery with the walls sort of caked with ochre and earth oh, that, was that he he developed after visiting I think it was up in Yurikala was it yes, he, he spent Yurikala, time yes. up there yeah. and with yeah, that little viewing good. platform yeah there's the viewing platform of tatami mats oh, and one of the privileges of working in an art museum is you get to see exhibitions before they open and just to be able to go down there in the morning or the evening and just sit there and you know, look at it and sort of almost sort of hear it crack and sometimes literally hear a bit of uh, mm. the clay fall over mm. and hit the ground. Um, and the other beautiful thing about, about this for, for us is you always, whenever I think of that space, even recently with Rembrandt's work in there, I still sort of think of it as the space where mm. Shinoda-san had his work mm. also. And that's one of the great lingering memories of a Biennale too. Mm. I think for the institution though, it's probably, it's, that's craziest experience in a uh, in a Biennale would be the um, Sai Guo Chang's work in 2000. Oh, yeah. The um, was it the, the performance Still Life when he had a mm. oh, um, sort funny. of a, a nude yeah. Lady Godiva yeah. figure on a horseback and he'd come in every morning and and, and paint her. <laughs> um, and it, but again, that shows how a Biennale really pushes an art institution to its limits, mm. and that I think is a really good thing. Mm. Yeah, some of the records that I have been flipping through the archive are just incredible. Mm. how radical mm. the Biennale was and how radical the art gallery was. Yeah. So there's some of the works that I wouldn't even propose because I can see that, no, no, you can't do that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> some, some of them are just super interesting yeah. to, to see how open and how sort of challenging the Biennale was. Yeah. Well, the next time you challenged, or the, or the Biennale challenge was in, uh, I think it was 2014 with Post Commodity. 
with the idea of just cutting a big hole in our floor. And uh, so down the Yerubana Gallery, mm. and we said, um, so I, I was there by that point, I came in 2012, and we said sure. And that I thought was fantastic too, because you went down to the Aboriginal Gallery, and you just see a, 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 a a square cut out of the concrete slab, and then there was raw earth. And it just it seems in the Yerubana Gallery, this is you know, the soil of Australia, the soil of yeah. Sydney, yeah. Uh, the soil that's been Aboriginal land for, for thousands of years, so the soil that saw all sorts of encounters between Aboriginal Australia and European and other settlers. <coughs> and to see that, that revealed and exposed in such a raw way in the middle of the gallery, mm. that I thought was a fantastic thing to re, yes. um, sort of push us ahead. Then the final joke was the, the artist, they, they tried to sell a slab of concrete. Mm. Yeah, that was a, a little bit cheeky, perhaps. But, um, <laughs> it's our concrete. Look at you now. Yeah. <laughs> Alexi, did you also continue seeing every Bien since 1990? You know, I moved, I went to live in um, Melbourne for a while oh, yes, and, and in Seoul for a while. So there are, little, there are a couple of gaps, mm -hmm. of regrettably. But yeah, by and large, yes. Mm. Mm. Can you and remember any very strong, like strongest work or experience? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, that question, because you read it and you, you sort of freeze up when you sent us the questions in advance, thinking, how can you choose just one? Mm. You know, and it is, I think, as Lisa points out, that experience of the Biennale, um, you know, over time, the accumulative experience and mm. the relationship that it builds mm. and the tentacles and the roots in the city mm. become something which nourish us. Mm. But, you know, there are specific things. I mean, for me... You know, that moment of going to Cockatoo Island in 2008 on, you know, the clunkety old ferries for Carol and Christophe Bagagiev's, you know, revolutions and walking into the Mike Parr mini-survey in the former penitentiary and, you know, that building with its history, smelling of urine and, you know, decay and how it had been left that way. And I, I do, you know, think 10 years later, how would the risk management plan go on that one? <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> but, um, but it was so extraordinary and that for me was just something where you realise that, you know, Carolyn had really kind of unearthed and seen our city in a way mm. that, for me, energised and reminded me of the things that surprised me about the place that we mm. live in. And that was really remarkable. And mm. I, you know, think things like Pier 2, 3, you know, every time when you'd go in, I still lament the loss of that as a venue. You know, that when you'd go mm. in and smell the wood and you'd have that feeling of mm. the creeks and you know how it always rains during the Biennale of Sydney, like Sydney floods, right? That's my most memorable work, <laughs> swimming between <laughs> venues. <laughs> and, you know, that feeling in Pier 2, 3 where it would creak and rain and wean and feel visceral and the films. Mm. And I remember on the top floor, Anthony Gormley's mm. um, work from Guangzhou with those, you know, figures and the smell of clay when it rained mm. in that building, heartbreaking, you know? Mm. Those sort of visceral sensations and things like the drum Wurundjeral at the MCA in 2000 and the Aboriginal art that's been shown at the Biennale of Sydney and what a critical role Gordon Bennett, you know, Richard Bell, you know, the seminal kind of moments. Tracy Moffat was scarred for life. You know, the premiere of that work was such an important piece. Mm. So, yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting that your first experience of Sydney Biennale and then next version was already... Was in the museum. <laughs> <your> museum. <laughs> well, I was a little bemused in 98 that mm. the museum wasn't a bigger part, I'll be quite honest. You know, the, the, you, I would, as an outsider, expect the Museum of Contemporary Art. There was a beautiful work actually by Anne Veronica Janssens in the 98 Biennale, the one with the, the mist coming through mm. the gallery, which was mm. very beautiful and very atmospheric, but it felt a little... I think it was alongside Sol the Wit. I think it was a John Calder project in the museum at the time. But as an outsider, I thought, why, why is the Museum of Contemporary Art so half-hearted about this somehow? And obviously, the history and so on. But um, my, uh, I was going to say John Marangel, I think also coming from overseas, to see um, amazing Aboriginal art in the context of international art, not mm. just other Australian art. Um, and, you know, the Biennale of 2000, I mean, we'll come back to it later, but it was a, such an important moment um, absolutely um, critical moment and an inspirational moment um, under the, the direction of Nick Waterloo, who, who was so incredible in his history with the Biennale, but particularly, as I mentioned before, where there had been a loss of confidence from the public. Um, I think I'm right in saying that 1998, they still charged and they sold something like 23,000 tickets. So that's not a very big audience. So there was that sense that mm. contemporary art was kind of like not engaging with an audience and 
um, and, and so on. And that was, a, you know, for me, obviously, a, a, a real issue when I came here at the mm. end of 99. I also should say I did see Juliana's Big in Melbourne in 1999, and that was amazing. And, of course, that kind of, I think, also galvanised Sydney again. And, mm. I, you know, again, mm. as an outsider, hadn't really realised about this Melbourne-Sydney thing until I got here, but... Um, it was, was it pretty the Mel interesting. Melbourne Biennale? One Melbourne Biennale. They call it the one, one in iteration the of it, <laughs> the one and only. The one but it was an amazing <laughs> exhibition. Mm. Really, a really extraordinary. And I saw Ricky Swallow <laughs> for the first time and lots of really interesting work. But uh, yeah. Was it a similar model of using different venues? Or? It was one venue, but mm. a very like an industrial uh, building. It was kind of. It was an apartment block. Apartment Russell building that was about right. to be renovated. Yeah. And mm. yeah. It was very contained. Yeah. It wasn't huge, yeah. it's the but hero it, was, building. it was it was quite it was quite something, and I think it mm. was sort of a bit of a it galvanised I, 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 mm. uh, the Sydney Biennale in a good way. Mm. Yeah, actually, I asked the second question you already, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to also ask now as a head of institution, um, how did you uh, start collaborating with the Biennale, and how? as an institution it had been engaging with the production and the operating mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah festival itself yeah so um <coughs> when i first started at carriage works um one of the things that i really wanted to achieve for our institution was to partner with the Biennale. <laughs> and so it was just before um catherine de zega mm. was Biennale mm. um in 2012 and um so I had a meeting with, with Catherine, and also there was um, another curator, Gerald. who was Gerald Master. McMasters. Um, but I think he'd been travelling at the time. And so I had a meeting with Catherine de Zager and showed her carriage works, and we talked about performance and the role of performance in her Biennale. And she um, said, I've always wanted to work with Anna Teresa de Kiersmarker. Um, there's a new work that she's just done called Cecina and Untendant, which was a very large scale contemporary dance work, which had a touring party of over 30. Um, I loved that idea immediately. Um, and so we started working towards presenting that work as part of the Biennale. And what was really great about that is that it was a scale of work that Carriage Works had never undertaken before. So it was an incredible push for us um, as a new institution on a whole range of different levels. So, um, and it was also Catherine giving us that pathway into that artist that we would never have had um, unless she'd given us that introduction and unless we'd had the context of the Biennale to do that within. So it was an incredibly important moment for Carriage Works in its life as an institution to um, present that work, produce that work and um, do it within the context of a, you know, a very important international um, visual arts um, context. And I think it really, um, really defined a path for us in terms of how we contribute and how we've related to the Biennale in terms of being able to produce work um, that, kind of, that comes from performative context. Because mm. one of the other large scale works that we worked on to produce was um, the work with Tassel Dean, which was a vent for a stage. And that was um, really just her wanting to create a piece of performance that she'd never done before. So that was a real journey for us as well. So we've really enjoyed being hands-on producers of works, particularly in relation to performance. But mm -hmm. that, that work of Anna Teresa de Kiersmarker was a real first step for us. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll go back to Michael, you also mentioned about Tara Shinoda mm. as uh, when you're already in the position of a director. Mm. And, uh, but when you started, or how you see probably as an institution, and you already mentioned quite a lot, but um, what was the, um, the benefit of having been out there for such a long time mm. in that um, historical institution? having all the different wings of European painting and Aboriginal painting, and how does the Biennale could fit in your mm. whole view? I think I should have a more extreme introduction to the Biennale than Lizanne did, because I think when I started work at the gallery in 2012, I spoke at the opening of the Biennale on my second night. <laughs> second night? Second <laughs> night, yes. <laughs> um, to a very large audience. And uh, uh, 
I think what stuns the institution, I mean, the Art Gallery of New South Wales has collected contemporary art since its very early, earliest days. So since the 1870s, we've been collecting contemporary art. But it was sort of started off also as a really a, a picture gallery that collected you know, paintings mm. and sculpture, not other art forms. Mm. So in a way, the way contemporary art finally evolved, it took a while to get going so quickly and less conservatively, it probably was still very much in that mode of contemporary paintings and you know, starting off with that. And I think the Biennale will have, would have, you know, from 76 onwards, being in our building, would have really loosened up the way we approached acquiring, well, f showing contemporary art in particular, but then also acquiring contemporary art. And I think mm -hmm. that's, um, that's been a very, very, very important part mm -hmm. of it. And you know, everyone who works there, and I mean, all of you who've been to the gallery over the years, would certainly go into certain spaces and remember mm. Biennale works they saw there. But also we got to work with some of the great curators, both Australian and international, and that's been a very, very important part of it for curators who worked there for many years to every couple of years to have that very intense experience mm. was a, has been a wonderful thing. has definitely sort of altered our, our sort of personality. Yeah, I think uh, that when Biennale office doesn't have 30 people, there used mm. to be like five people or something, mm. at least the director, assistant, a couple other people. Mm. So a lot of uh, curatorial or um, coordinating part was done by yeah, curators absolutely. at uh, Art Gallery. Mm. Mm. And uh, there's so much record of uh, negotiations and mm. correspondence with the, the, the artist. And, and that's a, another really, really important thing, a bit like the APT in, in Brisbane is um, it really got us working with artists. So, mm. to, so rather than sort of like buying a painting or buying a video, but actually mm. installing works and having artists, you know, really push, out, push us to the limit of our tolerance of cutting holes in floors and things like that. And that's a really, really important part of art practice for art museums is it's not just the director and curators. Um, it is also artists being a very active voice in mm. how the works are realised in those public spaces. Mm. Also, in earlier time, like particularly in 1979, that a lot of uh, performance art happened in the yeah. gallery, and then also following years. Mm. So I actually happened to meet Min Tanaka, Japanese Buto oh, dancer, yeah. who yeah. did uh, perform in an uh, art gallery in 1982. Mm. And uh, when I was looking at archive, and then next day I went back to Japan and I just happened to meet him mm -hmm. in one of the opening and I was like oh Tanaka-san I, I was just uh, looking at your picture from the 82 and he painted his body in dark brown yeah. and then just um, with this uh, the whole naked body was uh, going through the uh, entrance court to outdoor mm -hmm. and he had a very clear memory of what he has done yeah. and uh, so it's it's one of the very uh, interesting um, function of the art gallery. And also, I mean, the, the other final big impact on us is, is with the design of the Sydney Modern Building. You know, and without the Sydney Biennale or Biennales in general, I think we'd be designing quite a different building. Mm. But now we're, we're designing a building that will be used for performance. We're designing a building that will have access to those, uh, that World War II oil tank, 20, 2,200 square metres um, of space. And, you know, I if you were designing a building without that sort of interaction with, with a Biennale type mm. work and with artists, it would be a very different sort of, mm. very different sort of structure. Mm. Yeah, what about uh, art space for you, Alexi? Because as one of the very critical sort of curatorial uh, base, mm. and uh, how does Biennale brings to your place? Yeah, it's an interesting relationship for the Biennale of Sydney and art space. And I think it really stands as testimony to the Biennale's commitment to risk experimentation and critical ideas that very early on they invited art space to participate as an artist run initiative back in the 1980s with those two exhibitions I mentioned before in 84 and 86. And then in 1992, when we moved into our current building, the Gunnery in Woolloomooloo, which was actually set up with an investment by Franco Belgiorno Nettis, mm, yes. um, the founder of the Biennale of Sydney. And the Biennale of Sydney had their offices on the middle floor up until five years ago in the Gunnery building. And so I can see Paula's here, so she was upstairs for a while. <laughs> um, and, you know, Art Space has had a really interesting relationship because it's kind of three pronged in a sense. I think if these other institutions, I think if it was Freudian, Art Space would be the id. 
of the BNI of Sydney, <laughs> probably to some other sort of super egos, but we're definitely the more agile kind of, you know, alternative space, but we always have these very strong exhibitions, um, like I said, from 1992 till now. But our relation, art space was established to support sort of cultural and linguistic diversity, the representation of diversity in our program, gender parity, a relationship with living artists, both Australian and international, with a focus on thinking through how you develop new work. So that's really the mandate of the organisation. And I think that the way that the relationship with the Biennale has evolved has been an interesting one. From 92 to 96 to 98, we were a venue. Um, and we always have been a venue. But in 1998, we launched a series of critical readers, um, which we produced for 10 years. We produced five editions. And these were really rather robust and complicated. And when we're having an archive discussion, I thought it was really important to mention these. And I went down a bit of a rabbit hole today looking at them again. I lost three hours of my day rereading <laughs> these moments. And what was really important about the readers, and I just want to read you this, because I think when we think about the Biennale, its relationship with our organisation shifts through time. And every year, you know, there's this kind of talk in the readers as it's captured about the instability of the relationship between the institutions and the Biennale. But I actually think that's a healthy thing because what it does is allow us to have this kind of tension that allows for things to shift and shape through time because nothing is static. You never hit an end point. And I just want to read to you because it's interesting. In 1998, Nick Sudis, who was the then director of Art Space, established the first critical reader, which was pretty vehement and critical of this particular edition of the Biennale of Sydney. It was, it was really, you know, it was aggressive and they didn't hold back. It was edited by Sue Best and Charles Green. And... Nick Sudis wrote about the establishment of the readers that this publication is the result of a serious concern for the lack or absence of critical practices in Sydney, let alone Australia. How can we deal with the theoretical implications of an extraordinary event like the Biennale of Sydney when everyday contemporary art practices by Australian practitioners are so inadequately critiqued? The project is therefore an attempt to redress this crisis and to provide opportunities for more meaningful and informed engagement with the Biennale, affirming art space's unequivocal, commi unequivocal commitment to speculative practices in contemporary art. So this is about a particular time where the tension between what is the role of Australian art in relationship to the Biennale of Sydney, is the Biennale 25 years on at that point still relevant in terms of bringing mm. international art to the city? Mm. And these are still questions 20 years later which hold currency. Mm. But in, 19, in 2006, and I just want to read you the final foreword that was actually published by Blair French, who's Deputy Director here at the MCA. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting shift in turn in terms of how we think as an institution about our relationship to the Biennale. And he writes, this publication is intended as an active entity rather than a document of an event or of a moment in contemporary art and its discourse. This publication takes on the larger challenge of thinking through the ongoing ramifications of encounters between the entity of the Biennale of Sydney and the cultural and social conditions of contemporary life locally, nationally and internationally. This critical reader is a form of thinking aloud about Australia's relationship to international art. So this is not anymore about a series of readers which is about trying to determine how Australian art posits itself in relationship mm. to the Biennale because of a deficit that exists locally, but about the fact that in that 10-year period, things have shifted, and we now want to own the conversation about the way in which we collaborate regularly, locally, nationally, and internationally. And I think that, for me, in an institutional refrain, has been interesting. Mm. Um, and, you know, for art space, I came on board as director in 2014, and probably my... My first experience of the Biennale was, I don't want to do this kind of one-upsmanship about brinksmanship about who had the harder time, <laughs> but when I began in the beginning of that year, I was so excited to come back and do my first Biennale. It was Juliana Engberg, and of course, I was a month into the job and the protests erupted over the conflict around private giving and Transfield Services and Transfield Holdings relationship to mandatory detention of asylum seekers, which I do want to say for the record is a human rights violation and absolutely untenable that Australia should continue to perpetrate this kind of human rights violation with the establishment of these camps. And so it was a really confronting and difficult time because we had this exhibition. Art, art space has always been very connected to artists, even through things like the readers, which were largely contributed to by artists. We count ourselves as very politically and socially charged. And so how did we respond? How did we act? And what was the viability or efficacy of non-participation as a political act? And what did non-participation mean when 78 artists had signed a boycott? And what did that actually mean out of 128 artists? The divisions that were existing, the schisms that were building, comments from people like Charles Escher or Nikos Papastagiotis, 
you know, the kinds of things that were circulating on social media. I think that that situation really amplified our inability to deal with the difficult underlying tensions that exist the relationship of institutional accountability to risk experimentation and critical ideas and the times in which we live. And can art actually do something between that? And for us, what we did in 2016 was we presented as part of Stephanie Rosenthal's um, exhibition. Um, our venue was called the Embassy of Non-Participation. And we actually worked with a collaboration called Mizer and Butler to develop an exhibition which looked at the politics and implications of non-participation as an act of resistance. Um, and we did a lot of public programs and education and did a writing program over 12 months called the Bureau of Writing. So I think you think as an institution, not in one way about the Biennale, but you're always thinking in a polyvalent way. Mm. Thank you. Back to Lisa. Mm -hmm. Your development with the Biennale. Mm, 2000. So I think I'd... Yeah, I came September 99. I don't think it's any secret to remind people that the museum had been through a very difficult time. <laughs> um, John Calder was the chairman and whipped me out of the UK and brought mm -hmm. me here. Um, and one of the things I was passionate about was re-engaging with an audience. I mean, there was certainly a feeling that both, that in relation to contemporary art, and I was, you know, I, could, I, I knew it was possible. I knew there was an audience for contemporary art, but I had everybody telling me, not in Sydney, you should be in Melbourne. It was a famous <laughs> night when someone said to me, one of the ex-board members said, you'll never get a contemporary art museum to work in this city. And I said, how do you work that out? He said, go to a dinner party in Melbourne, everybody's sitting around the table talking <laughs> ideas. In Sydney, they're out on the balcony talking about real estate, looking at the <laughs> was still there. I was like, oh, help. <laughs> um, so we made the decision in 2000. I, I just loved what Nick Waterloo was trying to do. It was a very important moment. And, I, I, and as an outsider, I loved the Biennale's individual you know, uh, curator model. But mm. in 2000, with this atmosphere around the lack of confidence from an audience and a lack of confidence from the art world, there was a lot of criticism that in 2000, uh, you know, the marking of the millennium, yep. to do an exhibition that was, I call it the greatest hits, and you're seeing some of it now, you know, Jeff Wall, Ger Ger Gerhard Richter, John Marangel, Yoko Ono, it wasn't a groundbreaking, risk-taking Biennale, it was what I call a reconnection Biennale, mm. and I thought it was such a smart move, it had six curators, big names, Sir Nicholas Sarota, you know, and, and so I said to, John and I sat down and talked about it, I said, we should give the whole museum Let's make a real statement, let's back it, mm. and we have to go free. Now, John will remember, the board was horrified when I said the museum <laughs> has to be free, because of course we were bankrupt, so we didn't have any money, so to take the door charge <laughs> off was pretty challenging. And then my marketing team was really anxious because they said, why would you do it with the Biennale? That's, that's one toxic brand and another toxic brand, and, <laughs> and, and why would you make that one free? Why don't we do something more popular and make that free? And I said, well, we are a museum of contemporary art. If we don't have confidence in contemporary art and an audience, I'm going to go back to the UK, frankly. Mm. So a lot of discussion, really interesting discussion with Edmund, who was mm -hmm. vehemently opposed to going free. Um, but the Biennale board and management backed it, and the B and the MCA board backed it. And I, ha I had m I was utterly beside myself in the two weeks running up to it because I really thought it was so high risk to take the door charge off. I thought, what happens if nobody comes? It's going to be an absolute disaster. I'm going to have to get on a plane and, and disappear. So we opened the doors, and it was fantastic. I'll never forget it. I went down through the museum that day, and it was packed. And there, there'd been a build-up of curiosity. Of course, there'd been a lot of publicity about mm. it. We got Telstra on board, reassured the board that we weren't um, going to bankrupt the museum fully <laughs> um, by getting Telstra to underwrite free access. So essentially, it was cash neutral. Uh, and there was just this great groundswell of interest mm. and people talking and discussing and looking at all these different works. And, art and just, you know, the, the place was buzzing and it was just amazing. And mm. it, that continued, you know, and it, it, in that year, our numbers doubled and continued to rise from that on moment on. So really that, that bringing together of an MCA in the Biennale. And I used to say to people, they say, well, does this mean the Biennale and the MCA is more important than the art gallery? And I said, absolutely not. Because the Biennale in the art gallery is seen within the context of its history and its, and its collections. Now the Biennale at the MCA is seen within the context of contemporary art, right through the building. And even now when we, we only give two floors, because of course we have our collection on the third floor, 
that again is a reading for the audience that is different from the reading that they will get in any other venue. Mm. So it was an incredibly exciting and unbelievably nerve-wracking time for us mm. and, uh, and really important, I think, that we did it. And, uh, and it, I think it allowed both organisations to make the most of their collaborative skills. Um, we had an amazing team. We've always had an amazing team of artist educators and artist installers. So that... that um, ethos of working with artists was very strong mm. here and, and be, being able to, if, if you like, double up with a Biennale that had the same kind of thinking mm. and it was a really, it was an important moment. And the second thing about that was we also may, had made partnerships in Western Sydney and I'll never forget the Mayor of Blacktown walking, walking up to the Gerhard Richter when they came on their visit um, with the town council and looking up at the Richter and going, he said, I'll be honest with you, he said, I came here today out of curiosity, because I really like the way the MCA is mm -hmm. wanting to work with us and helping us with our gallery. I didn't expect to like anything. <laughs> I'm not really a contemporary art person. He said, but you know what? I really like this painting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but I really like it. And I went, that's it. That's why we have to be free, so that people can walk in like him, mm. take the barriers down, make them feel welcome, don't put them off by, mm. you know, door charge, people dressed in black, all the kind of stereotypes, people looking down the nose at you, using language that they can't understand, etc., yeah. etc. Et mm. All those stereotypes about contemporary art that have kept people out of contemporary mm. art galleries for years yeah. and we just we, we, we broke it right down. It was mm. it was fabulous. Now with the ticketed show you're doing really well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One a year. <laughs> One a year. The power of Instagram yes. and we won't go there. And of course Pippalotti actually to be fair was such a success in Juliana's Biennale. Mm. That was yeah, how yeah. that project yeah. started. Yeah. And I think, like Michael, you, mm. you, you have these experiences with artists. And she said to me then, wouldn't it be great to do a big show together? And I went, yeah, let's just find the right moment. So mm. often with artists, you mm. know, it, you, you get to know them through a Biennale and then you can work with them in a, muse a, mm. a more, um, you know, more intense museum mm. way. Yeah, I think uh, after uh, working for this Biennale for about 20 months, I still think that you can do more to come in and uh, I, so this, uh, we have another probably 40 minutes to discuss how can we do better uh, to make more meaningful and continue uh, this uh, important collaboration. And for instance, um, I thought actually now um, to do a new commission, for instance, for the artist to come and do uh, new work for Sydney Biennale. And if you only have 20 months, and artists probably have one year, and if you want to get uh, important big artists, big names, they're also busy. <laughs> it's hard to get them to come and then do a site visit. Mm. And, uh, but something maybe possibly like co-commission with the uh, Art Gallery or MCA, or mm -hmm. somehow just from the very beginning, and uh, with maybe longer discussion with the, uh, maybe not with the artistic director, but maybe Biennale team, somehow I think how can Biennale preparation could go beyond these 20 months mm -hmm. and have a longer relationship with certain artists. But also uh, um, this time I'm trying to bring a few works from the collection so three artists from my MCA collection are shown together uh, with other artists and also a few more from my art gallery collection, particularly some of the artists like Miriam Khan, who was in 1986 uh, Biennale. It became, her work became part of the collection. So bringing that work from 84 and uh, showing new group of paintings together with those group of works. So that kind of uh, revisiting the, the art that works, and then also uh, Lily Dujuli, who is doing an entrance court, who was also in a Biennale in 1980s. And uh, this is her second visit after 30 years, and now doing a new work. But somehow, I think that there must be a um, better way or way to engage a little bit more. So I just wanted to have your frank idea of how, what has been missing, or what could have done better, or this is a great private space for that, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say anything. But these, these, kind of, these relationships ebb and flow, don't they? You know, at certain moments, things work, and at certain moments, they don't work. Yeah. But I think, 
you know, I think the fact that we've all, the three of us, sorry, not, not Alex, but the other three of us worked on the National together mm. has mm -hmm. been a great role model for us about how we, we can yeah. work together. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it, it is incredibly important. I mean, I really, I think we all lose if we compete. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, it's about celebrating mm -hmm. the fact that mm -hmm. this is a great city for contemporary art and how can we actually make the most of it. Um, a lot of it goes back to planning. It goes back to, I think, a recognition... Um, from everybody, from the Biennale and from all the partners, that we are all in it together. No, we're not. It's not like a festival. People find it hard to understand that the visual arts is different. It's not a festival. You don't just come along and, you know, drop a performance or a piece of theatre. I know you don't work like that, but some places do. You know, you just, you know, an artistic director will say, "Well, I'm going to bring this co-production from from Holland, and we'll we'll show it at the Opera mm. House." Mm. That's not how the Biennale. Biennale and the and, and the venues work, and mm. they shouldn't. We're not venues; we're actually partners. Mm. Um, and the more we can actually work together from the beginning with the Biennale to to shape the ideas. What are the uh, what are the what kind of Biennale do we want to see in this city? Yeah, I mean it's a question mm. for the, for the audience as well. What what would it be great? Why don't we have more discussion about what it is that people are looking for? A lot of people mm. are traveling now; they're seeing mm. things. Mm. And then that recognition of the different levels of audience, people seeing things for the first time and also people who are very experienced and, and know what they're looking at. Mm. Um, and I love the way that you're bringing the, the past past artists again. We often have this thing about we only show them once. Yeah. you know, And that's why with Pippa Lotti it was like, oh, well, she had a big presence in the Biennale. Should we really do another big sh do? Should we do a big mm. show mm. that everybody's seen that work? Yeah. Well, yeah, but actually the big show was mm. very different from one work. So... Mm. Rethinking those kind of orthodox ways that sometimes we kind of automatically say, oh, well, that was the Biennale, we'll do something yeah. something else is really important. And sometimes I think the time frame is challenging yeah. um, and it can be your enemy, but it can also be the friend to actually making a critical moment to create something. Mm. So, you know, even our experience of working with Tassa Dean to make a full piece of theatre mm. in a period of eight weeks, which was also a film and a radio documentary, mm. Um, creating that environment and that tight time frame to have that space to create, I think, is something that is really positive as well. Because sometimes work can be given too much time as well as not enough time. So I think that that time frame can be really right. good. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And I think the Biennale, you know, is the catalyst to bring someone like Tasta Dean into an environment to take a risk that she wouldn't necessarily take. Mm. So yeah, I also thought that you were showing now beautiful Katharina Grosse as a part of the Sydney Festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking with Bezri from the Sydney Festival that he does only two weeks, and uh, but he's al already preparing the program for next year and then the following year. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, and we complain about two years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, um, <coughs> um, this is a medium that uh, contemporary art deal with performing performance art mm -hmm. and uh, the Sydney Festival is performance festival but doing installation art so mm -hmm. that sort of uh, overlapping mm -hmm. could be maybe Biennale could do something during the Sydney Festival and maybe Seth part of the Sydney Festival could come into the Biennale somehow I was thinking that because I think that's a nice idea in terms of co-commissioning mm -hmm. yeah. and co-investment mm -hmm. um, across festivals as well as across institutions mm -hmm. So I think those layers of infrastructure in yeah. terms of how does the Biennale partner with the Writers' Festival, with, yeah. you know, with all of the... Because there has been this great festivalisation mm. of Sydney yeah. and you can't go a week without really yeah, a yeah, festival. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, th I think it's really <laughs> um, becoming really about so the city of Sydney. It's, it's, how, it's how there's co-investment and strategic alignment to make sure that artists mm. um, and the industry is making the very the most of that. Mm. There um, was an initiative, there was yeah. a festivals initiative at one stage, the Writers Festival, the Biennale and what was the other one? The Film Festival? I can't remember. There was, I remember there was a big campaign around it one year mm. and then it kind of fizzled away. Mm. But we've Maybe, been doing that yeah. with uh, the last two summers, working with the Sydney Festival. Uh, so this year with the Rembrandt and the uh, Dutch Golden Age exhibition, working with the Australian Brandenburg Orchestra and John Bell. And then the previous year working with Sydney Dance Company and Raphael Bonicella to really to commission jointly 
um, performances that take place within an exhibition. Now that's January and mm. the Biennale is not on, but I mean there's, there's a good model yeah. and we, we found it very, very exciting to work mm. with them and I think the, the performers found it fantastic also to perform mm. in those sort of spaces. I mean, I and, think, and yeah. also think. So I was mm. thinking about your expansion. You have mm. much more space in five years or something. That's going to be quite different from Sydney. When you, if you think about, you know, two thousand two hundred square meters of oil tank space. Yeah. Um, much more space uh, yeah. in general for the archaeology of New South Wales. Different sort of spaces. Right. Uh, and that that will you know, bring all sorts of possibilities. Yes. Out. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, partnerships is really a model that all our organisations are using to collaborate in order to extend the way in which we build capacity to support the development of new work. So mm -hmm. Artspace just collaborated with the Dhaka Art Summit, which is a new biennial model in Bangladesh to commission a substantial new work recently with Ramesh Mari and Nithyendra. And, you know, you're collaborating all the time. You know, we just collaborated with Sydney Festival and we're always touring and working in these forms. And I think all our institutions are doing that. I think there's a bigger question to be asked, which is one which really appears over and over and over again in the readers, and there's still the question mm. now, and, and that is, you know, your appointment is the critical junction. You know, who you are, who's in that yeah. seat, mm. is actually what defines this. Mm. And I think there's a big question for the Biennale of Sydney, and, and with all due respect, and it's been great to be a director as one of the four partner venues these past four years, and we can not each two-year cycle we can nominate either individually or together the person who we think or people we think should be the curator or artistic director for the next edition of the Biennale. And I think there's actually a question to be asked. None of us program in a project-by-project project cycle. You know, as you said before, you mm. met Pippa Pippa Lodi did a major work mm. here four years ago and that led three and a half years later to a major exhibition. You're actually looking at your program as a responsible, as a responsible institution almost 10 years in advance, mm. and you're thinking, working backwards, what are the things we need to do? What are the absences? Where mm. are the points that we can ameliorate or introduce something different or important to the local context? How can we not be too prescriptive about what we want to do in the future and leave elasticity to be responsive and agile? But at the same time, how can we actually be strategic in identifying what we need in order to build res resources for those approaches and for a more diverse response or approach? We've relied on a very authorial approach for the curatorial for the Sydney Biennale to date. There was 2000 with the curatorium, there was Catherine and mm. Gerald. But other than that, it's really been a singular curator mm. authored biennial of a very particular model and a very particular generation of biennials. And I think, you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily for the Biennale board to work with the partner venues mm. and to work with the public more broadly to do some workshops mm. looking forward at who we think we might want to do the next 10 years, the next five mm. editions, mm. the kinds of biennials we want to see. The fact of the matter is when you don't do that work, you end up not having a curator from Asia for 42 years. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, yeah. Mummy Karaoke is the first time the Sydney Biennale has been curated in a solo capacity by a curator from the region. Right. And Fumio Nanjo in 2000, that's not enough. Asia, Australia is part of the region, you know. You have to think not mm. two years in advance, but you have to think 10. Mm. I was actually thinking when I was going through all this research process, I wish they had asked me four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe be an sure that we point. Didn't? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe be an sure, you've always been on the list. I don't uh, know how we didn't get to maybe you uh, be an could appoint two two times in advance. Yeah. Yes. So that one like next one doesn't have a time, but uh, already you can appoint twenty twenty two. Then this person could start conversation already in a parallel way or something. Just we need, we need to break this um, cycle of twenty months. And also, I think what Alex is saying is absolutely right. It has to be more strategic and less. Oh well, let's you know have a bit of a beauty contest, see which one we like the look of, and mm. more what is important for Sydney. And I th and I also I think we need to be thinking about our position in the region, but also internationally. There are all these other biennales. So we've got a local audience we need to answer to, but we also want, to, of course, we want to bring the international audience mm. here. And the Biennales, we haven't mentioned that. It's one of the main functions of the Biennale was to bring international curators there, here. And it does to this day. You know, we've got fantastic numbers of people coming out for this one. And, um, and that's another really important function. And thinking, what is it we want to showcase? How do we want to showcase our artists within an international context? What kind of issues are... Are, are going to, to be of interest to our colleagues internationally. And, and I think we have um, an increasingly um, fascinating and diverse art world out there. And uh, the, the Sydney Biennale needs to respond to the changing circumstances. There are, how many Biennales are there in Asia now? Somebody will know. Well, there's 158 biennials in the world. In the world. Um, so I don't know how many specifically are in the region, though. 
Of course, She's in Australia, I mean, you talked earlier on about the Melbourne, the one Melbourne Biennial and how that really got the Sydney Biennale sort of moving again. I mean, now we have the NGV Triennial. So now yes. we have three in Australia, APT, NGV, and this. And what, what, what does that mean for that, us? What does that mean? I mean, they get, what, eight, eight million dollars of state funding for mm. that exhibition? Um, and then the, the Michael's question. finally mentioned the elephant in the room, which is money. <laughs> well, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and it's and, that, and then the question of spectacle. We're in Sydney, so, I mean, we can talk about could, that. Could you, could you have a you know a Biennale which wasn't spectacular? I mean, could yeah. it just be? Could it be serious? Could it be small? Mm. But you know, the NGV is certainly that's one particular model. APT has been very successful for many years with a different mm. sort of model. Mm. Um, but you can't ignore what's happening in the region. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. There's a great mm. quote from Charles Green in the 2000 Reader where he says, the 1992 Biennale of Sydney was probably the last Biennale not to have struggled against financial catastrophe. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is not, this is not a news flash. No. Yeah. And I think we're hearing it globally. Documenta went six million euro over mm. budget where you know, seeing a crisis with things like the Guangzhou Biennale, we're seeing, you know, it's, it's a refrain that we're hearing all the time. Mm. So, you know, as institutions, we're operating in an ever-diminishing economy of returns and we have to diversify mm. forms of income and revenue by thinking strategically about what we do, how we do it and who we do it for, mm. all the while meeting a whole range of different set of ethical criteria. Mm. And, you know, I think with the Biennale of Sydney, it's a good point from you, you know, mm. does it need to be every time it's almost like crisis management when an artistic director is appointed, there's the idea that this is the budget, but it's not enough. It needs to be this. If this isn't met, what happens? Mm. And so then, you know, you're operating in this persistent cycle of insufficiency. And so how do we actually deliver a biennial mm. that has that kind of level of magnificence, in a sense, that you expect mm. from a biennial, but at the same time manage expectations or, you know, preserve the sanity of the artistic director? Mm. Yeah, I think it's extremely... Uh, fi financially, <laughs> it's extremely... Um, uh, challenging model um, to start from, um, like, in a way, start with no budget to st for during these 20 months, the whole team keep fundraising, and uh, it, in parallel, the artistic decision has to be made, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's very challenging model, and uh, but going to meet all these enormous amount of the private patrons and supporters for the Vietnam, which is amazing. But I, I also understand that uh, the similar group of people are supporting so many other <laughs> institutions and it's events. Mm. So uh, it seems to be like from the same pot, you're asking for different occasions and different scale. Mm. So uh, this, is, this was also something that maybe this institution could come together and mm. think about something, some other model. To uh, maybe maybe the, that could be, yeah. What if Sydney Biennale becomes triennial? Yeah. Well, there's you know I think mm -hmm. yeah I mean there's a, there's something here which is about um, you know you spoke in the beginning about collaboration. Could we collaborate more to do more co-commissioning? But the real economy of the art world isn't money; it's relationships. And it's the relationships that we build with artists, with each other, benefactors in Australia over the past 25 years, mm. private giving, philanthropy and benefaction has changed enormously in Australia. And the private giving community are very much now collaborators in the process of developing new work. Mm. And very few of us develop exhibitions or new works without that form of collaboration. It's no longer, you know, sponsorship. It's actually a partnership. And so in a sense, we have to again think more strategically and long term about the appointment of the artistic director, about how those relationships can be brought together earlier to establish the necessity for trust, mm. to take the risk to develop these kinds of projects or to invest more with our own institutions. Yeah, particularly when there is already sort of enough international programs happening in the city. Mm. It's a completely different environment from 1973. Mm. There was no other opportunity mm. for people to see international art. But now, mm. like, all these things are happening. So my question mm. at the beginning was, do why? I really, yeah, why am I here? What, what do I need to do? And what do they want to see? And like, what's, what's the it? answer? It's, it's, still, <laughs> it's still in a mystery. Yeah. But That's I the same, exactly the same question that Sydney Festival Hmm. is asking as well because yeah. they're now bringing international work within the context that you can see international work in Sydney every single day. Yeah. So I think you know there's conversations also to be had um, around that festival model between festivals hmm. and even between biennales. Hmm. 
So I think there's a broader national conversation to happen outside of Sydney too. Mm. But maybe it's the same rationale as we had with the national in the end. It's about the the coming together of all the venues. I mean, if you Mm. drop any of us out, it becomes something much less. Mm. So it is, I mean, for us certainly, I mean, of course some of the artists we could find ourselves, but, you know, you get one, I like the one model, I must say, one artistic director who brings their vision and it's outside the institution and it's in another perspective. Um, of course, it's not mm. as radical as it would have been when there was nothing else happening in mm. the city, but mm. things have changed dramatically. And I think what it is, is it's amplified because the four, mm. five, six institutions, however many take part, mm. are then um, together. I have to say, I have a bit of a thing about biennales that have too many venues, mm. <laughs> because I think audiences get fatigued, you know, going mm. off and looking for artworks that you can't find and the maps are never right and something's around, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I, I used to joke when I used to go on, to, on, on these kind of art walks and I used to say, oh, just put it back in the galleries, at least we know where it is, yeah. you can find it. And, um, so I, I'm, always, I'm always a bit negative about, you know, taking things out into the city. I mean, some of it works, but a lot of the time it really doesn't, let's yeah. be honest. And yeah. there's so much else happening in the city. I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not talking about new spaces like carriage works or, or, or cockatoo, but actually the whole idea that somehow it has to infiltrate the city is, for me, is a little bit problematic. And I think we're, the strength is in the, the coming together and the joint marketing resources, mm. let's be frank, yeah. you know, that yeah, yeah, individually yeah. we could not market mm. an individual exhibition, but, mm. but together, mm. you know, there's a huge huge boost our numbers go up quite mm. substantially mm. not as much as they used to interestingly there's a bump but it's not as mm. much as it was mm. um but you know I, there's a big question around cockatoo island i mean the whole costs I infrastructure yeah. costs out there and also care of artworks and audience engagement which you know we're all very concerned with you know what kind of experience does an audience have on cockatoo mm. compared to um you know in, an, in any of our venues is very mm. different yeah, it's it's extremely different experience, but uh, uh, to understand as an outsider to understand the history of the nation and also the city, mm. it's it's very interesting place. Absolutely. And uh, I wanted to actually use the Hyde Park Barracks Museum too to understand the context, but it wasn't really possible to use the, the space mm. as a venue. But uh, yeah, I really would like to propose after I finish my job, <laughs> maybe maybe all of you and uh, Sydney Festival and uh, Writers Festival and Vivid and everyone makes massive like art institution festival congress or something to, well, in a big... I mean, I think, it's a great idea. I think yeah. you know, there's, 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 I mean, 20 years ago in Sydney, you know, there was so much tension that existed between our institutions. Mm. It's not a Pollyanna city where we're all holding hands, but there is a lot more collegiality and there is a sense of mm. accountability and the leadership mm. at our mm. institutions now that we have a really great relationship. We partner together, mm. you know, we work together, you know, you work with each other, mm. you know, we're all working in a very different way. UNSW has established a new network called the Sydney Culture Network and actually had 30 cultural organisations through Greater Sydney meet over an 18-month period for the first time for many of us to visit all the different venues from the Royal Botanical Gardens through to the Powerhouse, through to the MCA, you know, through to ICE in Parramatta to talk about what we do and how we can work together. So there is this willingness to want to work that way and there is a necessity that's Mm. also being driven by a desire to continue to exist. Mm. But there is a question for the Biennale of Sydney about why does the Biennale of Sydney exist? You know, it's one thing to hold a Congress, asking everyone to come together, but the Biennale of Sydney has been a kind of pavilion model biennial. Mm. It's like Sao Paulo, it's like Lyon biennial. You know, it's, it's a biennial that exists in venues. Mm. And so when you proliferate, and I think it's a key point, Lizanne, when you proliferate it mm. across venues in the city, you're taking on a manifesto or a different kind of itinerant model, and you're asking the artistic director to work in a number of different mm. modes of curating simultaneously, not necessarily with the budget to realise that. The great thing we get, we don't want to not be a partner for the Biennale because that relationship with the artistic director and the relationship of artists that you bring to us is really nourishing. You know, it's really enriching. And, you know, we have four artists in residence with us every two Mm. years making work and commissions at art space for the other venues. But we don't want to lose that. But I think we have to ask the question why, you know, really in a legitimate way before the appointment of the next artistic director, why does the biennial exist? Who does it exist for? How does it exist? And does the way it's existed to date really have efficacy going forward? It might, but it might not. Mm. 
Yeah, I think it's really important to keep asking that question mm. because uh, in the uh, archive display we are going to have at the Art Gallery New South Wales that we are showing these kind of um, documents from 19, between 1976 and 1979 uh, uh, and 79 that uh, between second and third because first one somehow happened and then when, after second one happened everyone in the art community qu started question, wait a minute what is this about Biennale? And why are we doing this? And uh, what about this um, women participation? And all this basic question came out. And looking at the document, and a group of artists uh, made a call, and then all these uh, art community people gathered, and uh, they invited uh, Franco Bergiononetis and all these people in the Biennale too, and they had a discussion. And, uh, but looking at the question, it's completely the question that is being asked to me, who are now so relevant. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fundamental, but a really important question to keep asking, because the needs and necessity is always changing, and the environment is always changing. I think there's a meeting that needs to occur at the beginning, and it never happened with your appointment. Mm. And in a sense, it's almost like a day in a room with the three of us, four of us on the sofa, with, you know, Cockatoo Island, with, you know, if you're thinking of including something, you know, like the barracks, and actually having everybody in a room for a day as the artistic director and talking about what your vision is and talking about how organisations can collaborate from the outset to support <coughs> the resources of the artistic mm. director. And, you know, that is a way that we work when we commission major projects with any other organisational partner. We have mm. a conversation together before we begin to make the work. Mm. And in a sense... I think that will help... Um, foreign artistic director really well mm -hmm. because you have to sort of blindly find out what is the needs, what is the necessity here and knowing that there had been accumulated experience of, in all of you who had seen multiple biennales and uh, so what else do you want to see? Mm -hmm. It's, it's a been a big question to me. But also this work you're doing around the archive is so important too by bringing and reminding us you know I was talking to an artist recently about it, and they said, oh, it's lost its edge. I said, well, what does that mean? You know, I mean, the whole context has changed now. You know, it is a, it, you know, let's face it, back then, I don't know how many visitors it would have had, but there wouldn't have been very many. And it was really important. You know, it was like a, a mini art space in a way. It was the kind of experimental on the edge. Now it's mass spectacle. You know, it's yep. mass spectacle. It expects to get half a million visitors, correct, mm. at least. Um, and uh, that has implications. I mean, I think Michael Jenny's was hinting at maybe, <laughs> maybe we can retract a little of yeah. that. And I mean, for goodness sake, Vivid does enough spectacle, can't we? Sort of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do something a little quieter. <laughs> we can all stick to the budget if we use torches. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I could take a few questions from the audience. Um, well, I will really welcome good suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? This Any is your moment. What kind of Biennale would you like to see? Yeah. Any thoughts? Do we have yeah, a microphone? Oh, okay. Um, my is it on? Else. <laughs> now I'm getting nervous as it gets louder and louder. Um, and I guess the Biennale has always been, uh, uh, you know, at the heart of um, my love of the visual arts. So I've had a few conversations, you know, we talk about the Biennale each time it comes around, colleagues and friends and artists. And it's, it's interesting to hear this discussion. And, and one of the things that Alexi raised, which was about the artistic director being the linchpin. Um, I appreciate there's a question about why the Biennale exists and how you shift that. But in terms of the organisation, from a structural perspective, the artistic director is a linchpin. Is there a possibility for an artistic director to stay beyond the two years? So that, that, that there is greater scope to develop things over a longer period of time. And then, then something that, that 
occurred to me just as we were talk- as you were talking then was in the in the you know days gone by the the board members uh, the participating venues had a place on the board and and played a very active role in that Ooh, we're getting in controversial too. well <laughs> well you know that but yeah but that was that you know we're talking about being collegiate now but is is that also another structural way in which <laughs> to in in which in which to enhance a collegiality going to make Lizanne's hair turn red. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't need to be the directors necessarily, but yeah. that it gives the venues, it gives them a real stake in the, in the Biennale the, the, and the vice versa. The short answer to that is there was a report done by the funding bodies that recommended that for uh, various reasons, I think the Sydney Festival went through it too, it was a move from what they called a stakeholder board to an independent board and that happened at the festival as well and it was to do with... I don't know, really. I mean, conflicts of interest potentially, but in my, I thought it was a bit nuts, really, because I, I, I really think that if you know, if you're talking together and you're working together, then you should share information about sponsorship and donors and everything else, because there isn't any point trying to compete. Because all we, I've said to Michael before, I, you know, if there's a sponsor bouncing between the two of us, I just go, no, let's not do this, because it's silly, you know. Okay, well, we'll put in a bid and it'll be, you know, we'll, we'll be less than the art gallery and they'll come to us. What's the point of that, really? So I, I actually think the closer you are, whether it's a board or whether it's some kind of, yeah. you know, close-knit group that sits underneath the board that can, you know, report in, which is, is our views and maybe other community views, artists, there are no artists on the Biennale board. Um, there haven't been since uh, Julie Rapp represented the MCA some years ago. I got so frustrated about the fact there weren't any, I actually gave my place over to an artist because it was, I thought, ridiculous that we have a, a major artistic organisation without artists engaged. So I think there are a number of models that we could be looking at and I think we should talk very freely with the Biennale about other, other opportunities. Of course, the National is another model. Yeah. Where there's no board and no funding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it happens because, we just do a great show. because the three of us want to make it happen because we think that Australian artists should have a venue to. And it's totally show their collaboration. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something else that's missing from the board, though, and that is Aboriginal representation. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, I think Absolutely. the first thing that people ask when they come to Sydney for the Biennale, the first thing artists want to do, and you took a trip last year with a group of artists to Uluru. Um, is making sure that there's Indigenous expertise within the administration of the Biennale as an organisation and Indigenous representation on that board because it is really still a critical area of interest internationally and it's something... I think it's coming more and more, I think. Yes, a necessity. And what about the idea of an artistic director staying on? No. Wants to go home. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we want to shoot your idea down. <laughs> I, 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 I think if um, if um, the Biennale has at least two hundred percent budget, then you can have healthy um, way of working. But uh, this financial condition now, it's so tight to give a burst to this major event. And if you, if you want to make it in an international level and high quality, then you have to just so much. And then after running through this marathon of once, and you'll be like <laughs> 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 It's hard to think to continue running. But uh, I think it's, it's also, uh, yeah, the how, how you continue and then also I think because the Nick Waterloo did multiple times mm-hmm. and uh, so if someone might want to come back, maybe not continuously, but maybe someone might come back later or, but there could be, uh, that could be a model. Mm. But uh, what do you think about... Uh, Can I just, I just want to say something, yeah. which is that there's a question there, which is about the role of the CEO yeah. or, you know, chief executive of the organisation and Joanna Bernie Dansker aside, who's arrived in done a stellar job in a short amount of time. You know, there are biennials like Lyon where Terry Raspu or, mm. you know, the Liverpool Biennial where Sally Talent is, in a sense, the ongoing artistic director mm. of the Biennale. And she collaborates with the appointed artistic directors to co-curate the biennial every time. So, in a sense, there's a chief executive who's separate mm. to the ongoing person who's responsible at a high level of operations as mm. the director of cultural programming or director of curatorial programming. Mm. And so that provides that ongoing relationship support to the incoming curator. Mm. And I'm not saying that that's the model here, but there are those models that exist. Mm -hmm. And again, it's that question of what is the model? 
what is the operational mm. structure of this biennial? Mm. Yeah, particularly for this um, indigenous community um, connection, that it's impossible for artists or foreign artists and director to come in and uh, build a relationship with certain community to do something mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. within given time. It was just impossible. So I that's where the venues can help. There's yeah, another yeah, area because yeah, yeah. we've yeah. all got expertise. Yeah. Within our mm -hmm. That's why having a day Absolutely. together right at the beginning yeah. before you invite yeah. an artist and before you do anything for yeah. work. Yeah. yeah, so you understand what the resources are available to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And everyone's transparent with each yeah. other. Yeah, because even you come in and would like to visit indigenous community and everyone asks, so mommy, which one, do, where do you want to go? Because I have no mm -hmm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I needed some kind of guidance of like particularity. It needs to be an induction kind. process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There could be that a philanthropist that. in this room who might yeah. want to support an indigenous curatorial position at the Biennale of Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps, <laughs> just putting it out there. <laughs> but also I wanted to ask, about the idea of uh, us being, being free. And uh, being free means that every money has to be given in other ways. And uh, by charging some part, um, we have our own generated income to be able to do something more. So I think it's- I'll give you the file about the correspondence yeah. between John Calder, and I think it was Paula actually, <laughs> about how do you distribute the money when you only have part of your venue that's charging. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a problem for the institutions. I think <laughs> it's a really complex issue, but uh, just thinking about this uh, uh, situation now, mm. I think probably something that you could explore in the future. But it's Joanne's job. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I think in Australia there is still an egalitarianism. And we do have a British funding model. You know, there has been obviously 2014, the consequence of the boycott from, mm. you know, direct consequence of the artist boycotts was Brandis' removal of funds, $25 million of the 45 million operational funds of the Australia Council. Um, you know, not all that money has been returned. And that was a direct consequence of the minister thinking that the arm's length approach of the Australia Council was no longer sustainable. And the Australia, the Biennale of Sydney is funded through state and federal agencies to a greater or lesser extent. And I think we do have an accountability to be free. And when you read the readers, you know, there's mm. such a moment where everybody's like, you know, it actually changes the way that audiences right. in Australia think mm. about <coughs> contemporary art when it becomes they free. It. There's suddenly this kind of moment where audiences are coming, where mm. suddenly you can do more. Mm. You can actually raise more money than you can raise through tickets, through mm. actually creating lateral programming. Mm. It's of course, the, the JPT is free and the NGV one is free. So yes. for Sydney to be paid, it would be... Difficult. Mm. Sydney likes, yeah, Australia likes to think itself a little bit egalitarian that way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, maybe I can take one more question before we close this gathering. Question or better suggestion? Mm -hmm. or yes, please. Hello, um, my question is for Mummy. I was just really interested in your approach to going back to the archives and I wanted to hear a little bit more about how that's informed your um, vision for the Biennale and uh, whether you bring that practice to other curatorial projects that you work on. Hmm. Yeah, I, sim I was simply curious about what has been done already and uh, what role the Biennale had been playing in the city and then also just imagining that everyone else has seen like a 10 Biennales or Penelope Seidler saw everything, like a 20 <laughs> editions <laughs> or John Cumber. So uh, it just seems to be quite silly not knowing what had happened before because it's, it's not about I'm just bringing the best of best into, into Sydney now, but it's, it's I'm part of the continuous history of something. So I wanted to see my position where I would be. And, uh, but also it's, it's much more recent uh, ways of looking at uh, art history in the, throughout the world. We have been talking about this sort of multiple modernity or world art history. And there have been so many parts of the history that we haven't, we haven't seen properly. 
and uh, even including some of the women artists or um, non-Western region, all of these. So just, we, we are in a time that we can renegotiate the understanding of the history. So uh, looking at a whole group of um, artists that uh, Biennale had shown over 1,800 artists, we're going to uh, list up everyone on the wall in the art gallery, but it's this amazing list of artists. You'll see it. Like everybody was here, including Marina Abramovich and Richter and Boyce. Seven, he didn't come, but participated seven times. And all of this uh, history is just amazing. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to continue the quality of the Biennale and uh, the, the role that it has been playing. And uh, it gave me so much inspiration. And uh, I was producing my Biennale parallelly, so it's, it's not really like a direct connection, but inspiration was so much, and then also, also energy around uh, Biennale and also local art communities, questions of, continuous question of this relevance of the Biennale is just amazing. So I think uh, when you come and see this archive section, and uh, Paula and our whole team worked so hard to pull out very interesting documents and photographs or give you um, lively energy or from the past. And uh, some of the artists, that I, as I mentioned, um, some of the artists are making a comeback to the 21st Biennale. And it's also interesting to see works from the 70s, like Luciano Fablo's work is from 1972, which is the time the Biennale started. And then also one of the Lily Dujuri's work is also from 72. And uh, we can also test the relevance of the art, value of the art. What does it mean if the work is from 45 years ago? Were newly made and how do we compare? So we are in a post-internet internet time that we can jump around different time and different geography. So uh, it's, it's our freedom to uh, look into different time and space. And uh, I think uh, our archive had been playing such an important role in that context. But uh, we, if we don't have any more questions, I think it's a good time to close and I would just welcome you everyone for the opening week and see what I have done. <laughs>